the twelfth lesson of a series of lessons in Raja Yoga. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Arabella Grayson. A series of lessons in Raja Yoga by Yogi Ramasharaka. The twelfth lesson, part two. Remember always that you are an individual, having a mind and will of your own. Rest firmly upon the base of your I consciousness, and you will find yourself able to manifest a wonderful strength against the adverse suggestions of others. Be your own suggester. Train and influence your subconscious mind yourself, and do not allow it to be tampered with by the suggestions of others. Grow the sense of individuality. There has been much written of recent years in the Western world regarding the effect of the mental attitude upon success and attainment upon the material plane. While much of this is nothing but the wildest imagining, still there remains a very firm and solid substratum of truth underlying it all. It is undoubtedly true that one's prevailing mental attitude is constantly manifesting and objectifying itself in his life. Things, circumstances, people, plans, all seem to fit into the general ideal of the strong mental attitude of a man, and this from the operation of mental law along a number of lines of action. In the first place, the mind, when directed toward a certain set of objects, becomes very alert to discover things concerning those objects, to seize upon things, opportunities, persons, ideas, and facts tending to promote the objects thought of. The man who is looking for facts to prove certain theories invariably finds them, and is also quite likely to overlook facts tending to disprove his theory. The optimist and the pessimist, passing along the same streets, each sees thousands of examples tending to fit in with his idea. As Kay says, when one is engaged in seeking for a thing, if he keep the image of it clearly before the mind, he will be very likely to find it, and that too, probably, where it would otherwise have escaped his notice. So when one is engaged in thinking on a subject, thoughts of things resembling it or bearing upon it, and tending to illustrate it, come up on every side. Truly, we may well say of the mind, as has been said of the eye, that it perceives only what it brings within the power of perceiving. John Burroughs has well said regarding this, that no one ever found the walking fern who did not have the walking fern in his mind. A person whose eye is full of Indian relics picks them up in every field he walks through. They are quickly recognized because the eye has been commissioned to find them. When the mind is kept firmly fixed upon some ideal or aim, its whole and varied powers are bent toward the realization and manifestation of that ideal. In thousands of ways the mind will operate to objectify the subjective mental attitude, a great proportion of the mental effort being accomplished along subconscious lines. It is of the greatest importance to one who wishes to succeed in any undertaking to keep before his mind's eye a clear mental image of that which he desires. He should picture the thing desired and himself as securing it until it becomes almost real. In this way he calls to his aid his entire mental force and power along the subconscious lines and, as it were, makes a clear path over which he may walk to accomplishment. Bain says regarding this, by aiming at a new construction we must clearly conceive what is aimed at. Where we have a very distinct and intelligible model before us, we are in a fair way to succeed. In proportion as the ideal is dim and wavering, we stagger or miscarry. Maudsley says, We cannot do an act voluntarily unless we know what we are going to do, and we cannot know exactly what we are going to do until we have taught ourselves to do it. Carpenter says, The continued concentration of attention upon a certain idea gives it a dominant power, not only over the mind, but over the body. Muller says, the idea of our own strength gives strength to our movements. A person who is confident of effecting anything by muscular efforts will do it more easily than one not so confident of his own power. 
Tanner says, to believe firmly is almost tantamount in the end to accomplishment. Extraordinary instances are related showing the influence of the will over even the involuntary muscles. Along the same lines, many Western writers have added their testimony to the yogi principle of the manifestation of thought into action. Kay has written, A clear and accurate idea of what we wish to do and how it is to be effected is of the utmost value and importance in all of the affairs of life. A man's conduct naturally shapes itself according to the ideas in his mind, and nothing contributes more to success in life than having a high ideal and keeping it constantly in view. Where such is the case, one can hardly fail in attaining it. Numerous unexpected circumstances will be found to conspire to bring it about, and even what seemed at first to be hostile may be converted into means for its furtherance while by having it constantly before the mind he will be ever ready to take advantage of any favoring circumstances that may present themselves. Along the same lines, Foster has written these remarkable words. It is wonderful how even the casualties of life seem to bow to a spirit that will not bow to them, and yield to subserve a design which they may, in their first apparent tendency, threaten to frustrate. When a firm, decisive spirit is recognized, it is curious to see how the space clears around a man and leaves him room and freedom. Simpson has said, A passionate desire and an unwearied will can perform impossibilities, or what seem to be such to the cold and feeble. And Maudsley gives to aspiring youth a great truth when he says, Thus it is that aspirations are often prophecies the harbingers of what a man shall be in a condition to perform. And we may conclude the paragraph by quoting Lighton, Dream, O youth, dream manfully and nobly, and thy dream shall be prophets. This principle of the power of the mental image is strongly impressed upon the mind of the shela, or student, by the yogi teachers. The student is taught that just as the house is erected in accordance with the plan of the architect, so is one's life built in accordance with the prevailing mental image. The mind subconsciously molds itself around the prevailing mental image or attitude and then proceeds to draw upon the outer world for material with which to build in accordance with the plan. Not only is one's character built in this way, but the circumstances and incidents of his life follow the same rule. The yogi student is instructed into the mysteries of the power of the mind in this direction, not that he may make use of it to build up material success or to realize his personal desires, for he is taught to avoid these things, but he is fully instructed nevertheless that he may understand the workings of the law around him. And it is a fact well known to close students of the occult that the few who have attained extraordinarily high degrees of development make use of this power in order to help the race. Many a world movement has been directed by the mind or minds of some of these advanced souls who are able to see the ideal of evolution ahead of the race, and by visualizing the same, and concentrating upon it in meditation, actually hasten the progress of the evolutionary wave, and cause to actually manifest that which they saw and upon which they had meditated. It is true that some occultists have used similar plans to further their own selfish personal ends, often without fully realizing just what power they were employing, but this merely illustrates the old fact that the forces of nature may be used rightly and wrongly. It is all the more reason why those who are desirous of advancing the race, of assisting in the evolution of the world, should make use of this mighty power in their work. Success is not reprehensible notwithstanding the fact that many have interpreted and applied the word in such a matter as to make it appear as if it had no other meaning or application other than the crude material selfish one generally attributed to it by reason of its misuse the western world is playing its part in the evolution of the race and its keynote is accomplishment those who have advanced so high that they are able to view the world of men as one sees a valley from a mountain peak recognize what this strenuous Western life means. They see mighty forces in operation, mighty principles being worked out by those who little dream of the ultimate significance that which they are doing. Mighty things are before the Western world today, 
Wonderful changes are going on. Great things are in the womb of time, and the hour of birth draws near. The men and women in the Western world feel within them the mighty urge to accomplish something, to take an active part in the great drama of life, and they are right in giving full expression to this urge, and are doing well in using every legitimate means in the line of expression. And this idea of the mental attitude or the mental image is one of the greatest factors in this striving for success. In this lesson we do not purpose giving success talks for our students. These lessons are intended to fill another field, and there are many other channels of information along the lines named. What we wish to do is to point out to our students the meaning of all this strenuous striving of the age in the Western world and the leading principle employed therein. The great achievements of the material world are being accomplished by means of the power of the mind. Men are beginning to understand that thought manifests itself in action, and that thought attracts to itself the things, persons, and circumstances in harmony with itself. The power of mind is being manifest in hundreds of ways. The power of desire, backed by faith and will, is beginning to be recognized as one of the greatest of known dynamic forces. The life of the race is entering into a new and strange stage of development and evolution, and in the years to come, mind will be seen, more clearly and still more clearly, to be the great principle underlying the world of material things and happenings. That all is mind is more than a dreamy metaphysical utterance is being recognized by the leaders in the world's thought. As we have said, great changes are before the world and the race, and every year brings us nearer to the beginning of them. In fact, the beginning is already upon us. Let any thinker stop and reflect over the wonderful changes of the past six years since the dawning of the twentieth century and he will be dull indeed if he sees not the trend of affairs. We are entering into a new great cycle of the race, and the old is being prepared for being dropped off like an old worn-out husk. Old conventions, ideals, customs, laws, ethics, and things sociological, economical, theological, philosophical, and metaphysical have been outgrown and are about to be shed by the race. The great cauldron of human thought is bubbling away fiercely, and many things are rising to its surface. Like all great changes, the good will come only with much pain. All birth is with pain. The race feels the pain and perpetual unrest, but knows not what is the disease nor the remedy. Many false cases of diagnosis and prescription are even now noticeable, and will become still more in evidence as the years roll by. Many self-styled saviors of the race, prescribers for the pain of the soul and mind, will arise and fall, but out of it all will come that for which the race now waits. The changes that are before us are as great as the changes in thought and life described in the late novel by H. G. Wells, entitled, In the Days of the Comet. In fact, Mr. Wells has indicated in that story some of the very changes that the advanced souls of the race have informed their students are before the race. The prophetic insight of the writer named seems marvelous until one realizes that even that writer is being used as a part of the mental machinery of the change itself. But the change will not come about by reason of the new gas caused by the brushing of the Earth's surface by a passing comet. It will come from the unfolding of the race mind the process being now under way. Are not the signs of mental unrest and discomfort becoming more and more apparent as the days go by? The pain is growing greater and the race is beginning to fret and chafe and moan. It knows not what it wants, but it knows that it feels pain and wants something to relieve that pain. The old things are beginning to totter and fall, and ideas rendered sacred by years of observance are being brushed aside with a startling display of irreverence. Under the surface of our civilization, we may hear the straining and groaning of the ideas and principles that are striving to force their way out onto the plane of manifestation. Men are running hither and thither, crying for a leader and a savior. They are trying this thing and that thing, but they find not that which they seek. They cry for satisfaction, but it eludes them. And yet all this search and disappointment is part of the great change and is preparing the race for that which must come. And yet the relief will not come from anything or things. 
it will come from within just as when in wells story things righted themselves when the vapor of the comet had cleared men's minds so will things take their new places when the mind of the race becomes cleared by the new unfoldment that is even now under way men are beginning to feel each other's pains they find themselves unsatisfied by the old rule of every man for himself and the devil take the hindmost it used to content the successful but now it doesn't seem to be so satisfying the man on top is becoming lonesome and dissatisfied and discontented his success seems to appall him in some mysterious manner and the man underneath feels stirring within himself strange longings and desires and dissatisfaction and new frictions are arising and new and startling ideas are being suddenly advanced supported and opposed and the relations between people seem to be unsatisfactory the old rules laws and bounds are proving irksome new strange and wild thoughts are coming into the minds of people which they dare not utter to their friends and yet these same friends are finding similar ideas within themselves and somehow underneath it all is to be found a certain honesty yes there is where the trouble seems to come the world is tiring of hypocrisy and dishonesty in all human relations and is crying aloud to be led back some way to truth and honesty in thought and action but it does not see the way out and it will not see the way out until the race mind unfolds still further and the pain of the new enfoldment is stirring the race to its depths from the deep recesses of the race mind arising to the surface old passions relics from the cave dweller days and all sorts of ugly mental relics of the past and they will continue to rise and show themselves until at last the bubbling pot will begin to quiet down and then will come a new peace and the best will come to the surface the essence of all the experiences of the race to our students we would say during the struggle ahead of the race play well your part doing the best you can living each day by itself meeting each new phase of life with confidence and courage be not deluded by appearances nor follow after strange prophets let the evolutionary processes work themselves out and do you fall in with the wave without struggling and without overmuch striving the law is working itself out well of that be assured those who have entered into even a partial understanding and recognition of the one life underlying will find that they will be as the chosen people during the changes that are coming to the race they have attained that which the race is reaching toward in pain and travail and the force behind the law will carry them along for they will be the leaven that is to lighten the great mass of the race in the new dispensation not by deed or by action but by thought will these people leaven the mass the thought is even now at work and all who read these words are playing a part in the work although they may know it not if the race could realize this truth of the one life underlying today the change would occur in a moment but it will not come in that way when this understanding gradually dawns upon the race this new consciousness then will things take their proper places and the lion and the lamb lie down together in peace we have thought it well to say these things in this the last lesson of this course they are needed words they will serve to point out the way to those who are able to read watch and wait for the silence that will follow the storm in this series of lessons we have endeavored to give you a plain practical presentation of some of the more important features of raja yoga but this phase of the subject as important and interesting as it is is not the highest phase of the great yoga teachings it is merely the preparation of the soil of the mind for what comes afterward the phase called nani yoga the yoga of wisdom is the highest of all the various phases of yoga although each of the lower steps is important in itself we find ourselves approaching the phase of our work for which we have long wished those who have advised and directed this work have counseled us to deal with the less advanced and simpler phases in order to prepare the minds of those who might be interested so that they would be ready for the higher teachings at times we have felt an impatience for the coming of the day when we would be able to teach the highest that has come to us and now the time seems to have come 
Following this course, we will begin a series of lessons in Nani Yoga, the Yoga of Wisdom, in which we will pass on to our students the highest teachings regarding the reality and its manifestations, the one and the many. The teachings that all is mind will be explained in such a manner as to be understood by all who have followed us so far. We will be able to impart to you the higher truths about spiritual evolution, sometimes called reincarnation, as well as spiritual cause and effect, often called karma. The highest truths about these important subjects are often obscured by popular misconceptions occasioned by partial teachings. We trust that you, our students, will wish to follow us still higher, higher than we have ventured so far, and we assure you that there is a truth to be seen and known that is as much higher than the other phases upon which we have touched as those phases have been higher than the current beliefs of the masses of the race. We trust that the powers of knowledge may guide and direct us that we may be able to convey our message so that it may be accepted and understood. We thank our students who have traveled thus far with us, and we assure them that their loving sympathy has ever been a help and an inspiration to us. Peace be with you. End of a series of lessons in Raja Yoga by Yogi Ramasharaka. Recording by Aravella Grayson.